Uh, we're going to move on then, and our next speaker um, is Harvey Kleiman. Uh, Harvey is an MD, uh, PhD, who works in obst um, obstetrics and gynecology at Yale University um, on a lot of different um, issues, particularly endometrial function, uh, and also has the um, unusual accolade of actually developing a lot of, of useful apps for doctors for investigating various issues in relation to infertility. And his talk today is entitled The Pelvis Skull Conflict, Why Trophoblast Inclusions Are a Mark of Autism and May Be the Evolutionary Basis of Human Intelligence. So thank you, Javi. I want to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to uh, share our work with you. So for many years, I've been interested in the question, can we use the placenta to actually predict what's happening in the brain? And besides this fanciful image that lines up a placenta looking like a brain, this may seem like a very strange concept, but I hope at the end of my talk that this will seem more reasonable to you. Now, for those of you who don't remember the details about the placenta or never knew them, let me just remind you that the placenta is part of the fetus. It is basically the root system of the tree, if you can think of it that way. And here I flipped it on its side, and this would be the fetus here with the tree trunk here, and underneath the ground are the roots of the pregnancy, which is the placenta. Of course, the mother is percolating blood into the intervillous space, and this is where the exchange of nutrients are. Uh, in my poster, I will be talking about trophoblast invasion in these vessels, but for this talk, I want to focus on the structure of the placenta itself. If we take one of these fingers, which are called the chorionic villi, it looks something like this. This is, again, where the exchange is. But let's take a knife and cut across one of the fingers and look at what we see. And we can see that there's a cellular structure to this chorionic villus. Here it is under higher power. The basic structure of the placenta is to always have two layers of trophoblasts in between the fetal circulation here and the mother's blood here. There is a basal stem cell layer called the cytotrophoblast, and those are the cells that proliferate and grow and turn into all the other trophoblasts of the placenta. We're only going to focus on the chorionic villi. And their relationship to the overlying syncytial trophoblast layer, which is the layer that makes all the hormones of pregnancy, mediates the exchange of nutrients from the mother to the embryo and fetus, is that the cytotrophoblasts proliferate and occasionally fuse with the overlying syncytial trophoblasts to allow it to grow. Now, in general, when you cut through the chorionic villi, they look like a round circle. And again, I've represented this diagrammatically by this inner green layer and an outer pink layer. What I've learned clinically in doing about 35 to 40 years of work, and as was mentioned, I'm a physician, OBGYN, who takes care of patients with infertility and pregnancy complications, is that I noticed that when I looked at pregnancies with genetic abnormalities, I saw things called trophoblast invaginations, where the bilayer actually bent inward, shown here under the microscope and diagrammatically right here. And if a knife happens to cut across one of these invaginations, it's called a trophoblast inclusion. So it'd be like sticking your finger, and don't do this at home, please, sticking your finger in some, some dough and taking a knife and cutting across your finger and looking at the dough and seeing your cross-section finger in the middle, that would be a trophoblast inclusion. So it's a structural tissue-related thing. It's not an inclusion within a cell itself. Now, what causes this to happen? Well, the work that I've done since the early 80s as a trophoblast biologist is to understand the relationship between these two layers of cells, and I call this the cytosensitial trophoblast balance concept. So again, these cells can either proliferate the cytotrophoblast or occasionally fuse with the overlying layer. And simply the kinetic relationship of those two phenomena is enough to give the entire structure of the placenta. So again, looking at this trophoblast invagination, you can see that where the invagination has occurred, there are too many cytotrophoblasts. That's why the bilayer has bent inward. And again, cutting through that gives you a trophoblast inclusion. Now, what is the normal situation in the placenta? The normal situation is bending outward to make new branches. And you can think of this as having more syncytial trophoblasts, more fusion leading to more material on the outside layer, 
causes it to bend outward. If they have equal proliferation and fusion so that proliferation equals two times fusion, the bilayer stays equal. That's how lengthening happens. And if there are too many cytotrophoblasts, where either there's too much proliferation or too little fusion, then it bends inward. This is the abnormality and associated with genetic abnormalities. Now, from a clinical point of view, you can actually draw a dose-response curve. So the most seriously abnormal genetic pregnancies, tetraploidy, four sets of chromosomes, don't make it past three weeks of gestation. Triploidy might make it into the first or second trimester. Trisomies, trisomy 21, 18, 13, have fewer trophoblast inclusions. Pregnancy losses that might go into the second trimester have fewer. And even intrauterine fetal demises up to the third trimester still have these trophoblast inclusions, but a small number. And hopefully most of us in the room are very close to the normal. We did not have any trophoblast inclusions in our placentas. Now, in a simple way, in a clinical way, I view this as a check engine light. It doesn't diagnose a specific genetic problem to have trophoblast inclusions. It simply says that there's a problem. And much like Barbara's telephone call, is Barbara still here, by the way? I don't know if she's still here. But uh, much like her telephone call, I got a telephone call also. In 1998, Wakefield published his now infamous study that said that autism was caused by the MMR vaccine. We know that that data was fabricated and has caused a horrible public health disaster since that time. One of the consequences of that publication was that patients started suing pediatricians for causing their children's autism. And I do a lot of medical legal consultations, and I was asked to look at a particular case where the family had read in the Sunday New York Times magazine that the MMR vaccine caused autism. Their child had autism, their child had an MMR vaccine, hence that's what the cause was. So I looked at this case and I found trophoblast inclusions. And I didn't understand anything about autism at this point now some 15 years ago, but I said to myself, this means that there's a genetic abnormality. I don't think it has anything to do with the MMR vaccine. So we first published a retrospective study and showed a significant correlation of children who had proven autism looking back at their placentas. We found that up to 40% had trophoblast inclusions. Now this was a very small study because you might think to yourself, and I can talk to anybody later, there aren't many people who hang on to their placentas after the child is born. So it's actually hard to find those. So the best way to do such a study is to do a prospective study. And luckily people at University of California at Davis were doing just this. They were collecting placentas of families at high risk for autism because they believed that there was an environmental factor in the formation of autism. So they had these placentas in a library. And I asked a very simple question, could I look at those blindly, not knowing what the outcomes were? We published this work in 2013, and we showed that there was a tremendous significant increased frequency of trophoblast inclusions in the high-risk group here compared to the controls. In fact, the controls, no placenta had more than two trophoblast inclusions in four different samples, whereas the high-risk autism group had up to 15 in four slides. So just like the dose-response curve I showed you before, there is a normal range, which I consider to be zero, and then autism is just above. It has an average of 0.5 trophoblast inclusions per slide. So it seems that, in fact, there is a correlation. And going back to my first question, does the placenta predict the brain? Well, it does seem to. Abnormal folding in the placenta see seems to be reflected in the abnormal folding that's seen in children with autism. Not only are their brains larger, but they have increased folding at a microscopic level and a macroscopic level. So MMR, surface MMR of children with autism have show increased folding of these brains. What I found even more interesting about children with autism is that the airways of the lungs showed increased branching. So this is a uh, mass, basically a mold of the bronchial tree. This is a bronchoscopy looking with a scope down a normal child's airway. Compare the normal on the left to the doublet branchings of children with autism. So the branches of the 
lung are actually branching more. And interestingly, in people who know children with autism know that they have a number of GI symptoms. When people look at the branching and folding of the, of the villi in the gut, there's increased folding there in the gut also, which is all background to why I'm here today. I wonder to myself, if this is a whole body situation, why is there increased folding? And could there be any advantage to that? And I realized, being an OBGYN, that one of the biggest problems that we face in terms of reproduction is this conflict, is getting the skull out of the female pelvis. And although you would have a tendency to think that having a larger head and a bigger brain would make you more intelligent, there is a very hard ceiling to that phenomenon. You cannot just have an infinitely and unfettered increase in skull size, because if you do, you won't get out of your mother's pelvis. So from an evolutionary point of view, I think what's happened is that there's been pressure to pack more brain power into this limited sphere by having increased folding. And I've shown here a diagram that, and I understand from, and I'm not an evolutionary biologist, that the ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny concept has had some, you know, uh, criticisms. But I think it's intriguing that when you start with a rat or a mouse and it shows no folding of the brain at all, and as you go up the phyla, here's the human right here with lots of folding, and here's the dolphin with the most folding. Now, in, bar, in sympathy to Barbara's talk this morning that we heard, I just want to mention that I'll be going to SeaWorld after this conference to be presenting to dolphins because they have expressed an interest in this work also. <laughs> now, if we look at human development in the embryo, you can see there's increased folding. So what I think is happening is that this increased folding is allowing us to put more CPU power into the limited skull size we have. And just like we saw before from John, there's a bell-shaped curve for this. You can think of most normal people of having a certain brain size and a certain amount of folding, and there are one and two and three standard deviations above the mean, and autism is going above the mean. Their heads are larger, their brains are larger, there's increased folding. And the converse, there's an unfortunate family in Turkey, a clan, that has a one-point mutation their heads are smaller, their brains are smaller, there's decrease of folding here. So I think that what, and I would just allow you to, for me to speculate a minute, I think that there might be evolutionary pressure globally to pack more brain into the skull, and that shows up in a whole host of genes which show increased folding in various organs, including the placenta as simply a marker, but its ultimate purpose is to get more brain power. So. In conclusion, what we're looking at now is the basis for this increased folding, what is the biology behind it, and how can we link these things together. I'd like to acknowledge the many people who've helped me with this study, and I think I have a little time for some questions now. Thank you. Uh, the very interesting. There was just a paper I saw published making the argument that in families that have autism, people who don't have autism have a slightly higher measured intelligence or IQ that might go along. So the point is that the increase in intelligence might be related to genetic variants that cause autism. And in those individuals, they may not have higher intellect, but they may have relatives who do. Right, so one of the, and I agree completely, and I think we all know families like this. Uh, I can even speak of my own family. They're high energy nuclear physicists and MIT professors and people who are very successful and smart, and then floating around, they're people with autism. And I think of autism as going off this curve that I showed you. When you're four standard deviations above the mean, you've passed the point of improvement and you can get to the point where the connections can't be made successfully. So I think I view, and I would never promote terminating pregnancies, for example, for this condition, because I think that the, this is where a lot of human intelligence comes from, is these genes. <laughs>